Hi, it's Bob Nicky. Um, this presentation I've kind of put together to maybe share some of the ideas and things that I've learned and about making boxes over the past 20 years and how I make them. Hope somebody might find it useful. As I say, I've been making boxes for for 20 years now. Uh, I've been published in a couple of books and magazines and been on TV once, but uh, mainly this is my avocation, my therapy, and just what I love to do. So. I'm happy to share it. If any of this is of, of use to uh, other people, that would be great. So this and subsequent presentations that I hope to do will cover the tools and techniques that I use to build a basic jewelry box. I don't at all intend to claim that this is the way, but only one way and one that I happen to like and I developed over time and it works very well for me. So this first presentation takes us up to the initial glue up. And then I'm hoping to put together subsequent ones, continuing the uh, construction, cutting the lid off, doing the inside, and, and so on. The first step in preparing to cut the box sides is to uh, get that blade set at a 45 degree angle. I don't uh, rely on the stops in the saw, although they're pretty accurate, but I do use a digital gauge to do a final check. The important thing is to make sure that that gauge body is not, not up against a blade tooth because the offset in that tooth is going to give you an error in that angle reading. So make sure it's on the, uh, the flat surface of the blade uh, and get your saw as close to an exact 45 degree as possible and that will work great. I do use a sled for the most part when cutting off the sides. It helps make sure that the boards don't twist as they slide across the table. And the accuracy and repeatability of the uh, stop that I use on the fence lets me cut the sides in sequence. For example, I cut side one, then I'm going to do the front, then I'm going to do side two, and then I'm going to do the back. So working along the board, a single board in that way gives me a th at least a three-way grain match at the corners. So the next thing I do is I take those sides and spread them out on the table and make sure I get the grain lined up the way it originally was in the board. And then I go ahead and I not, not mark excuse me, the top and the corners so that when I am routing in the next steps, which are becoming up, uh, that I'll be able to know which side is up. And I'll, when I'm doing the glue up, I'll be able to rematch the corners. Knowing which side is up is turns out to be quite important as I've learned the hard way by uh, routing at least one of the sides upside down several times. So this is a real life learning experience. You know, a lot of jewelry boxes are built with one or more trays or inserts, something on the inside. And often they get supported by gluing in additional runners and glides, pieces of wood that the, that the drawers can or slides can uh, move on. And I never liked those approaches for a number of reasons. And probably the first and foremost is that we all typically want to start with three quarter inch stock or something like that. And well, that's too bulky. So then we plane it down to a half inch, build a box and then start gluing pieces back in to create runners. If we don't do, if we start with the three quarter, we don't plane it down. Then when we go to cut that lid off and we look at that interface between the top and the bottom where the hinge is going to go, it's way too bulky and it's not aesthetically pleasing. So what I do is I cut profiles into the box sides before everything is assembled and they create internal rails and that thins out the stock at that interface between the lid and the, and the base. And I shoot typically for a half an inch to five eighths of an inch there uh, when I'm making the box. So depending on this case, I'm starting with a, with a two tray box. I'm going to, start with three quarter inch stock, but at that interface between the lid and the base, it's going to end up being somewhere right around a half an inch. So I take these side pieces that have been marked with the, with the top and the, uh, the right corners, and I use a mortising bit, typically a one and a quarter inch diameter, one and a half inch diameter, depending on the size of the box. Uh, in this case, I'm using a CMT one and a quarter inch bit. I use my anchor gauge to set that bit height to an eighth of an inch to start with. 
and I do have more on my my blog artnabox.com uh, about the anchor gauge and how I use that in my shop. Great tool. On the next step, I use a number of uh, one of a number of drawings that I've put together over the years just to give me some guidelines as to how I typically want to space out the uh, ledges for the uh, trays, uh, given the particular width of that board that I'm starting with. So then I mark on the side of one of the pieces uh, a sketch, if you will, of where those profiles are going to be made. Uh, I try and, and obviously get the start point of each of the two uh, tray guides marked. Everything else is just kind of a sketch, so again, I can make sure I'm looking at which is the top and which is the bottom uh, of, of, the, uh, of the side. But basically, we're creating rails that those trays are going to slide back and forth on. So the profile cuts done in multiple steps. First, I do it at that one eighth inch depth across the full area that's going to be relieved for the glides for, for this profile. And then raising the bit another eighth of an inch, I'll come back and deepen the uh, cut for the top tree and the top rail. Now I pull out my anchor gauge again and I want to set up to cut the grooves for the bottom and the lid. And at this point I want to make them the same width and distance from the edge and eliminating again one common error of mine which is cutting one of the sides upside down. Typically I'll start with a 3 16 spiral bit. I want to make a groove that's a quarter inch deep and the appropriate width to satisfy the plywood that I'm using for that bottom. So it's typically going to take me two passes to get to that quarter inch uh, depth. You could try to rush it, but then you'll, like I do, find out what it sounds and feels like when the bit snaps off. You're going to have to widen that groove out. So I first get the 3 16 wide quarter inch deep cut. And then I'm going to, uh, with my veneer, I'm going to mic the thickness of the plywood that's going in the bottom and the width of the uh, groove and adjust my fence accordingly so that I can get the groove at the appropriate width for the base. Right now I typically position that groove about a quarter of an inch down from the top and up from the bottom of the box sides. So next I'm going to actually cut those grooves and you may ask why do I pull the piece back through the cut after making the initial cut? And what I found was that the spiral bit leaves one edge of the groove nice and smooth, while the other side uh, is not so, and it's typically the side that's going to be up against the fence. So by backing it out, I actually clean out that roughness and smooth both sides of the groove. But you do need to be careful because with hardwoods, there's going to be a good amount of packed sawdust in the groove, and if you're not careful, that can yank that board away from the fence and uh, do a fair amount of damage. So the last step in profiling the sides uh, is to cut a 45 degree chamfer on the inside edge of the lid. Uh, this is just an aesthetic thing. Uh, for years I've left it square, but it's really not that great looking. So I've started adding that 45 degree chamfer, which, which I really like. And again, it's, it's not necessary. But this is, this is what it's going to look like. So when that lid is open, there's this nice even transition on up into uh, the, the inside of the lid. 
So the next thing is to cut the plywood bottom, and I measure for that as shown in the picture there using a uh, steel rule. Lay it in the, the groove, kind of tip it backwards so it kind of locks itself in place and measure the distance. I want to get that plywood to be as close of an exact fit as I can without uh, having any chance of it being any, any too long because the, the box won't glue up tightly then. And then once I cut the plywood and verify that it fits well, I'll use that plywood as a template to cut the, uh, the wood for the lid, which is obviously uh, more valuable and I want to make sure I get it right. I do rip the lid slightly smaller across the long grain or the end grain uh, side to allow for some expansion and contraction with the seasons. Then I get to profiling the lid itself. There's a number of different bits that I use. In this case, uh, I'm using a 15 degree white side shaker cabinet uh, door bit, uh, which I've come to like quite a bit. So I set that bit in there. Then I will uh, align my lid with the or lid stock with the groove and decide do I want that lid to be flush with the edge of the box, proud of that, or recessed. And based on that, I'll mark where I want the uh, top profile to, uh, to fall. I, since the groove is a quarter of an inch deep, I'm going to set that uh, white side bit for the final cut so that the tenon is about 5 sixteenths of an inch. So I've got a little area for the wood to move uh, as it floats through the seasons. The lid profile is cut in multiple steps, multiple passes to make sure that we minimize any chip out. And uh, you'll notice that I'm using a backer board on the uh, end grain uh, sides as well to uh, further prevent any chip out that we might get. Now once I have that top profile uh, cut to where I want it to be, then I'm going to lower the bit, uh, actually almost all the way down. I want to measure the thickness of the tenon uh, as it remains, measure the width of the groove in the uh, box side, and then start reducing the thickness of that tenon by cutting the back side until I get it to a nice snug but smooth fit into the into the uh, groove of the panel. So actually at this point the box is ready for sanding uh, on the inside and then going ahead to glue up. So when I do that I glue the bottom plywood in all the way around which gives me a real strong construction uh, at least for the base and our corner feathers are going to help out further as well as with the lid. But because the lid is solid it's going to have to move and float uh, with the changes in humidity. So it will be attached with just a small dab of glue in the center of the two uh, sides, the short sides, which are the end grain sides of the, uh, of the lid. I glue it up. We're using, uh, I use these Bessie clamps half for years. I find them to be about the best that you can, can have for doing box work. I use them primarily for four-sided boxes, but they can work for five, six, eight-sided boxes as well. Uh, and I know a lot of people get by using rubber bands, but when I start working with wood this size or boxes this size, I sure like to have a couple of these that I can really torque down as needed to bring some recalcitrant wood into shape. One of the things I've learned to do as I'm gluing it up is to do my initial uh, alignment, if you will, looking at the inside corners of the miters, not the outside. When those inside corners are lined up 
uh, where they're completely uh, square, the box will be square. So I, I do that, I get the clamp started and I'll do and stuck down and then I'll do a final check with the uh, with a square on the outside corners. And if I do have to move it at all slightly, I'll put a uh, quick grip clamp corner to corner in the direction that I want to uh, bring the box back into square. It seems to work out quite nicely. Now I haven't said anything about that inlay on the lid. I'm going to do a separate little video on how I did that since obviously it, it's not anything essential for, for building a basic jewelry box, but I will show that in another video. So that's about it. I hope I didn't stumble and stammer too long and I hope you got an idea or two out of this. If so, uh, I'll be looking forward to sharing some more with you. Thanks very much.